Well, we're going to have a little fun here and test out a cheap spring kosh. Spring kosh is kind of the old-fashioned term. It's a flexible telescoping baton. And this kind of odd weapon configuration, well, it interests me for obvious reasons, right? It's kind of a descendant of the blackjack. This has been a thing for over a hundred years at this point, but it's never truly taken off, and there's probably a reason for that, as we'll see. It's a really odd weapon. It started more like this. Here's an actual World War I trench kosh using a spring shaft. But that is a very sturdy spring, so you don't get that crazy whippy motion that you saw a second ago with mine. Also, this is more of a classic truncheon, right? It's very top-heavy. Meanwhile, Germany invented the telescoping batons in general, including the spring variety, like this. The big innovation here, of course, is that something that fits in your pocket, something that's not much bigger or wider than your hand, can extend out to, say, full billy club length. But physically, that really changes things. Your center of gravity is now further down, so, right? so it's bottom-heavy instead of top-heavy, and that's really odd. Almost any truncheon in history is either going to be uniformly weighted or top-heavy. Here's another example, old example, with a great weighted kosh below it. And you notice it has some kind of a knob, right? some kind of a striking surface, a striking head. Well, that makes sense, and most of them have that, but when you put all of that together and add a high degree of flexibility like this one has, then you get this. You basically get a steel whip. The difference is, on a whip, the end, the lashing end, does not come back at you. Not like this anyway, bounce back at you, right? I don't know when makers started making them this flexible, but the original examples, uh, the ones that were used by security forces in Eastern Europe, uh, were definitely, from what I understand, much sturdier. So they were more like a billy club that had some give to it than a whip. And that actually completely changes things. First though, look at the degree of flexibility here. Practically comes back to the shaft. So you don't get driving push-through force upon impact with this. But you do get impact. Uh, I would even say quite a bit. This is not a pine board, the kind that you break in karate class. This is a very durable plank that we're going to use, uh, as you'll see later when I use something else against it. Anyway, the impact here, think of it as all dissipating upon impact, right? It puts everything it can into the target, but then it's instantly done. Kind of like a slung shot. Because of that, you get no pushback up your arm, saves all the stress, rebound stress on your arm, but because you get no pushback, you get no push through, which is where you get to put in a little bit extra, and some of the experiments I've done, like with that giant medicine ball, striking it with a baton, like, you can feel it. I love the impressions that this left in the wood, and again, this is a tough wood, as you'll see. Uh, I think that means I did a good job striking, right, because the head came down flush just about where I would have wanted it, and that's the thing with a weapon like this, it's timing based. In a way, all weapons are. Of course, you want to swing with the right timing, but the more flexible, the more important that is. The way I point this out to people is, like with a bullwhip, right, it can lash skin, it can cut to the bone, some people say, but you have to swing it just right. The flexibility maximizes the effectiveness when timed right. If you swing clumsily with a bullwhip, well, it's practically useless. Can you get the maximum extra velocity the flexibility is affording you? If you don't, you might just be saving your target some impact, rather than imparting more. Now let's step it up to a gray brick. Kind of a patio brick. And got a chunk to come off. And that was really just with a moderate swing. I'm also beating the crap out of this cheap weapon. It's not going to survive very well, but I expected that. Speaking of abusing it, here's a red brick, which is really taking things up to a ridiculous level. Cool effect here, too. You see that? Was that like an actual shockwave or something that made the uh, the iPhone wobble? And the whole video is worth it just for that. So you can see the line and an actual chunk. I saw the chunk go flying off as well. And I thought it flew towards the camera, so maybe it zinged by the camera and caused it to wobble. But here's the unedited still shot of the post-impact. Pretty cool. Now, I would not have been surprised at all if the steel head had just come flying off of this thing, or it had become, you know, irreparably bent upon striking a red brick. So actually it did better than I thought. Especially given its low reputation, uh, telescoping batons in general aren't thought much of, in my opinion, in kind of the uh, impact weapon connoisseur community. And you can see why for both the rigid and flexible variety. Granted, it's cool that it can open 
into a much longer weapon, but that gives it the odd physics aspect that we talked about, odd center of gravity. That shot there wasn't bad at all. The more moving parts something has, the more opportunity for failure and breakage, which you can start to see here. So you've got that as well. It could fail on you, it could fail to open. And at the end of the day, you just wonder if it's worth all of that, all the potential drawbacks or drawbacks, just because it's small enough to fit in a pocket, but then extend out to a longer length. Uh, yes, by the way, I am wearing socks with sandals, but I ran like a dozen miles before doing this video. So, a noticeable chunk this time. I'm pleasantly surprised. You know, the gray bricks, like I used to break short stacks of them in karate. I wouldn't ever, even as a young man, dream of attempting to hit this with my bare hands. And we got two chunks out of it. In my opinion, this is not just a pain compliance weapon. It would actually do injury, including serious injury, if you hit the right spot and you swing in a way that maximizes its effectiveness. Well, why am I holding a jute? Why am I showing you this? Funny enough, on this very day that I was finishing off this video, a friend made me this. So here's a rigid, solid steel short baton. Here's a more polished example. And I want to test it against the exact same kind of wood for a real apples to apples comparison. And you can see the dent is a very close approximation to what our cheapy spring kosh did. Unfortunately, I don't even know what kind of wood this is. I just know that I went above the pine because I wanted something tougher, and it's really tough. Uh, a good prank would be to substitute one of these planks into a karate class. I'm joking. Somebody would break their hand on it. And there you can see how it struck home. So, comparable results to a non-telescoping, right, solid steel baton. Granted, one that's a little bit shorter. And then just wondering what in the world it was going to take to actually bust through one of these planks in that kind of that freestanding fashion that I was using, by the way. You know, it's a lot easier when you have it on two pillars and they both push back in the classic martial arts class method. Uh, had to go to this. <laughs> and this, you know, hardware store generic hammer did, of course, in fact, go right through it and crack it in half. And, you know, for people who don't know weapons or weapons history very well, they might think, well, why is a self-defense implement so much less effective than just a common tool like this? Well, because... If you think about a feudal Japanese policeman's baton, or a modern police's telescoping, or even solid one, they're not meant to be as effective as possible. They tread kind of a middle ground, or else you could just walk around with a hammer. A hammer is meant to do as much damage as absolutely possible. Go look at a medieval or renaissance warhammer, like an actual warhammer in a museum that was meant for fighting an armored opponent, and it's not really that different than, you know, what you can buy at the hardware store today. Well, here is a forebear of my, once again, cheap uh, modern telescoping spring kosh. These were used by British Special Forces in World War II. There's a really cool incident involving that in my book. But the bottom line on the low-cost modern version, I hope to test a high-cost version uh, someday, is that it devolved from the kind of thing we're looking at here in this picture to more of a telescoping steel whip. Uh, the closest thing you could compare it to would actually be kind of a Cossack traditional whip. A lot of sap collectors know what I'm talking about. It really occupies that same space, kind of a pain compliance tool that could still do some serious damage if used right, but could also, just like the ASP batons police carry so often today, could just end up flailing against your opponent and not doing enough for the fundamental physics-based reasons that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, I was using this as a very inexpensive jogging companion, and it's probably worth it for that kind of thing. For real self-defense, I think the best thing you could say about it is that it would probably be pretty intimidating because it's just so odd lashing around in that seemingly unpredictable fashion. Whipping this thing around in front of you would probably look a lot scarier, if you will, than with a straight baton. And lastly, these are mass-produced yet rare because they're just not that popular. Um, so, you know me, I like odd impact weapons. Thought it was well worth the money to uh, check this one out. Thanks for watching.